Hello, I'm Krista Yadro, and welcome to Music Learning Academy Presents Episode 1, Transitioning a Piano Studio to Music Moves for Piano. For those that may not be familiar with Music Moves for Piano, it's a brilliant piano method by Marilyn Lowe that applies Edwin E. Gordon's music learning theory to the teaching of piano. I'm thrilled to have Hannah Mayo join us today. Hannah attended the University of Louisiana at Lafayette for both undergraduate and graduate degrees. She currently teaches preschool partner lessons, early childhood music classes, collegiate level class piano, and private and group lessons in her home studio. Hannah applies music learning theory to her teaching across the board, and I'm excited to talk to her today about how she transitioned her piano students in her home studio from a traditional method to Music Moves for Piano. So Hannah, thank you for being with us here today. You're very welcome, I'm so excited. So let's get a little bit about your background. Um, tell us a little bit about your piano studio. When did you begin? Um, I started as a pedagogy intern in 2005 or six, and I had two students and it was a very progressive pedagogy program. And then I slowly added students um, through the rest of undergrad. And then I built up a pretty significant size studio in grad school. And then um, around 2009 or 10, whenever I graduated, I had probably about 25 students. And then 25 grew to 40. And currently I'm at... Um, it teeters between 50 and 55, depending on the current year and the preschool where I teach. That's wonderful. Yeah. And when you first started your piano student um, studio, what ages were they? Um, it was all young beginners. Um, I didn't have any older ones until my younger ones grew up. Mm -hmm. And what method did you start them with? I used Music Tree for the beginning of it, but I found it to be a little bit... Um, over some of their heads and so then I would incorporate um, kind of just my own thing and I did a lot of research as a grad student in um, like Orff and Kodai and Gordon a little bit and so I would just it was kind of like a mishmash of whatever I thought was gonna work mm -hmm. but I started with, with Music Tree and I have used Piano Safari a little bit but once again it was not exactly what I thought it would be but those are the two methods that I've really tried. And I also um, never really committed to one method. Like I would use one method for this student and a, a different method for another student, just kind of depending on their needs. And why do you think you switched um, methods with the students? Um, I never really got to a place where I, I liked it that much. You know, I was never in love with any of the methods that I tried. Um, and I don't think my students were very in love with the methods that they were trying. And it was fun. And we did a lot of games and movement and um, like whole body, Dow Crows kinds of inspired things in the lesson. But as far as the actual book that the students had, they never really seemed that into it. And I was never really that into it. So I, um, used it a little bit because you know you kind of have to you got to send them home with a book so they can practice <laughs> but um, a lot of what i did was um wrote pieces and uh repertoire pieces that weren't belonging to any particular method and then i would just teach the way i teach now you said you did um research when you were in graduate school and that you came across music learning theory and edwin gordon what about that caught your eye at first um, it was the word audiation that I was really interested in, and uh, I, I didn't, it was a new word, I'd never heard it before, and I also came across the the early version of Music Moves whenever the keyboard games was still one book as the preparatory book, and there was a, a box in the pedagogy library at my school, and it had all these Music Moves books, and it had the pattern CD, and it had a little bit about audiation, you know, some of the pamphlets. And I started looking at these materials and I was so confused. I just, I, <laughs> but I played the songs and I really liked the repertoire. Like I had, I had two kids at the time through my internship and I needed duet music. And so I found uh, the Music Moves for Two book was in that packet and I started using the duets 
with those two kids. And I just liked the songs. You know, they were easy to teach by rote. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that that's exactly how I was supposed to be teaching them. Um, but I did that and they liked the songs. I liked the songs and it, um, that's kind of what got me into music moves was, uh, the music moves for two book. And I know that that's totally out of sequence, but that's, <laughs> I did a lot of things out of sequence before I understood anything. So about, how long do you feel it took to um, start to embrace music moves for piano and, and think, oh, oh, maybe I should look a little bit more into it? Like a decade. Yeah. <laughs> I, I used the materials um, a little bit incorrectly for a while. Um, I started really getting into it when I started teaching preschool. And I, um, I got hired as the preschool general music teacher and as the piano teacher at this wonderful preschool in Lafayette. And um, she, she gave me free reign. I could do whatever I wanted. And so I, once again, out of sequence and incorrectly, I was using the pattern CD, integrating it into the preschool music classes. And then, um, so I, I, was, I was seeing my own deficiencies because there were a lot of patterns that I could not speak back like once they got more complicated mm -hmm. so I would put the pattern CD on in the car and I would practice the patterns and um, what I started to notice was that in my own playing and my own sight reading and all of the things that I was doing as a musician I was feeling those deficiencies but then I was also seeing major improvements in how quickly I was learning music and I got to a place where I, I didn't mean to, it just sort of happened. I um, was sight reading through some mildly difficult music one day and I was do daying and do ta day ta, do ta day ta instead of counting. And I was seeing tonal patterns as, you know, like a, the tonic and dom and do mi so, so ti re. And I, it was so easy and I was just kind of flowing along. And that's when I was, that was my light bulb moment. I said, there is definitely something to this. I need to really understand what this method is all about. I need to try it for real, correctly. And that was my light bulb moment. And the way I did that, um, prior to going to the Boston course, the piano course, I just said, I'm not going to try and make a big, huge switch. I'm going to let all the preschool kids keep their same books. Um, but I will have a copy of Keyboard Games A in the lesson. And I will have them play one or two keyboard games every lesson, you know, an old one and a new one and kind of go back and forth like that. And that's all I did at the beginning. And for a full semester, we would play keyboard games in the lesson, but they didn't do it at home, sadly, but they're doing it now. Uh, but, and they liked it so much more than their old book. And you could see that they were more confident because of the, the sequence and how slowly and, um, how slowly it moved and how properly sequenced it was. You could see that they liked it a lot and you could see them building confidence in their skills. Mm -hmm. And at this point, did you do any movement or improvisation before the Boston course? We, we were doing a lot of movement already, um, but not in the same free flowing kind of way, or um, I, I wasn't doing the singing or the chanting. We would move to recorded music a lot. Um, I wasn't singing and chanting and moving until after the Boston course. Mm -hmm. And then I started um, the, the example that we had every morning whenever we were doing our singing and chanting was really what gave me the confidence to do that. Right. And for those that um, might not know, when Hannah's talking about the Boston course, um, the Gordon Institute of Music Learning, which is called Gimmel, uh, they offer professional development level courses um, about applying music learning theory to different, um, uh, to piano, to instrumental, to early childhood, to elementary general. And these are two week courses. Um, so if anybody's interested, check out Gimmel.org and you can find out some more information about those courses. I highly recommend. <laughs> absolutely. Oh my goodness. Absolutely. More than one I recommend. Um, oh yeah. I'm going to do one every summer. <laughs> oh, if I could, I, I've taken three so far and I'm, I'm lucky enough to have, um, I think it was 2006, maybe 2006, go out to Michigan and um, do the early childhood one with, with Dr. Gordon. So I'll always, always remember that. Um, so so you found keyboard. So you're doing keyboard games. This is before the Boston 
um, Gimel course, you're doing some keyboard games with your younger students. Um, what were your hesitations about jumping right in to it before the course that you took? Um, visually, it was so different than what I was used to that it's very intimidating. And yeah. I, I didn't really understand what I was supposed to do. Um, but I, once there are the Facebook groups that um, there's a couple of different ones, but I got on all of the Gordon and Music Moves Facebook groups and I started asking some questions and reading posts and I was getting um, a, a lot, this came up a lot, follow the lesson plan, follow the lesson plan. And so I got a copy of the keyboard game lesson plan and I started looking at that and I started doing more of what they recommend. And that's when things kind of gelled a mm -hmm. little bit more. Yeah. Um, but as far as like transitioning at the beginning, before the Boston course, I didn't really have the confidence. And I think that was my main hang up was I wasn't quite sure what I was doing in that regard. And I definitely knew that I could teach piano this way. So I was going to kind of stick to this way and integrate it a little bit as much as I thought I could. But that was the most intimidating thing was the um, not understanding fully, which is why the lesson plans are so important. And also the, the notation, you know, the rote notation. Uh, it was just so different. That was my main hang up. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people encounter that when they, um, especially if they don't have any experience with music learning theory and they're opening up that teacher's edition and seeing all these new words and oh yeah <laughs> you know, and, and not being able to conceptualize well what's this going to look like and what are my students going to be able to do and um so that brings us to the boston course where you got to spend two weeks with um with marilyn and jenny and myself and i think we had 20 um other participants in that course and be able to talk about it and to see it and to really dive into the theory um, so you took that course and that was in 2016, 18. There was just this last year. Oh, the first summer. one I took was 2016. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Things are, um, lots of dates, lots of years. Um, so 2018, so just this past summer, um, and now you're starting to transition your studio after you return to return yes. home. I did start transitioning the older ones before Boston too, uh, oh, okay. in a different way, but you know, um, I, I think that that's coming later in a, in a different conversation. So I'll wait. <laughs> I'm sure we're gonna have, we are going to have a question about, about older kids. Yeah. <laughs> older kids as well. So, um, so now you're back, you're back home after this wonderful experience in the summer. And how did you kind of jump right in when you got home? What were kind of the steps that you took? I committed to the method and I put every student in a music moves book and made it, you know, part of the tuition. Um, every, every single student was required to be in a music moves book. So the younger, everybody started, mo mostly everyone started with a keyboard game book. Um, if they were younger, older mm -hmm. ones, um, I would start it in book one. I know that there's some some thoughts about that, but I, just because they were, you know, like third, fourth and fifth grade and we would supplement keyboard games in the lesson. So we were still getting those keyboard games. Um, but, and then with older kids, I, uh, put them in the keyality book and did some interesting things with that. And they have all seemed to really like it and see its benefits too. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's how I just said, Everybody gets a book and we would still do their other thing. You know, we do other repertoire. We would do things that they were used to doing, but every lesson we had a, a music moves time. Mm -hmm. And you had to start somewhere. You had to right. commit to doing it and they have the books. And right. um, so with your students now, even before Boston, I guess, are they mostly private? Do you have groups of students as well? Um, I have all kinds of setups. <laughs> I have uh, partner lessons. I have small groups of three, four, sometimes five. Mm -hmm. I have overlapping lessons. I have multi-age groups. Um, I, I have, like you name it, I probably have it. So I'm all over the place when it comes to formats for teaching. 
And was this, um, can you kind of tell us the purpose of that? Was it because of scheduling? I know so many students right now, because even we experience that at Brooklyn Music School, um, they have busy schedules. So it can be hard to schedule students. So how did you kind of come about um, having these different groups and um, scheduling them? Prior to Boston, I knew that I wanted to do groups. Um, that's been something that I've really been, uh, believed in strongly since the very beginning. And, and pedagogically, I was taught in school that kids are going to just do better in partners or groups. And that's, um, that was our format was a private partner, private format. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's where it all started. I knew groups was the way to go. And I, it took forever. It was very tedious, but I worked with all the parents and um, got everyone in a group except for the like high school, some most middle school kids and my high school students. They all remained private. Now they overlap some, um, but for the most part, I had already gone to groups prior to like uh, committing fully to music moves. So that was already kind of there. Um, after Boston, I saw that there could be some value in overlapping and doing multi-age groups. And that's when I started doing some of that. And a lot of it is uh, based on uh, supply and demand. I only have so much time to supply um, the demand for piano lessons. Thank goodness for all the piano teachers here is very high demand for piano teachers. And um, so a lot of that came from just needing to fit a lot of kids in the week. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you're giving um, the students all music moves for piano books yes. and starting them in there. What were, I guess this is two, two part question. First, what were the students responses, especially if they hadn't had like the book um, with them before? And then also what were the parents responses? Mostly everybody was just kind of like, okay, I, I do new things all the time. So that wasn't really a big surprise for the parents or the students. They're like, oh, okay, Miss Hannah's just doing something new. And <laughs> I'm kind of known for trying new things. <laughs> so that wasn't a really big deal. Um, they like, they like their book. You know, they like that they can um, draw in it. A lot of them draw little pictures, you know, like the, um, whatever the title is, like chocolate chip cookies, you draw some chocolate chip cookies in the book because there's so much blank space. Um, they um, they like that they can listen and they can hear everything. And everybody has been pretty receptive to the Music Moves book. I only had one student who was not so receptive, um, but it was mostly because she was older. She was very used to um, not being too creative. She also came to me much later. She was She started when she was in my seventh or eighth grade. And she stayed with me for a few years, but that's the only student that I lost because of the switch. And it was mostly having to do with her fear of improvisation. She hated improvising. And um, I, you know, I did as much as I could to sort of like gently put her into improvising. It was sad because she was so good at it. Yeah, um, yeah but she had no confidence in herself with that particular skill. Mm -hmm. But that's the only student that decided to go a different direction and most about everyone parents? else was really receptive parents were receptive as well parents were i think i'm i'm lucky i uh i have really good trust with the parents of the kids that i teach and a lot of my students have been teaching for a very long time so if i say this is the way this is what we need to try then they're gonna be okay with that that's excellent yeah um so uh, what were some of then the biggest challenges once you jumped into music moves for piano with every student? Um, there, even though the parents trusted me, um, there was a lot of having to educate the parents. There was a lot of conversation about what they needed to be doing at home. And, you know, that's, that's not always perfect. They still don't do everything that they're supposed to do. But that's the beauty of music moves is even when they don't, it still benefits them. Um, and probably I would say the biggest challenge for me was 
I was so excited about music moves and I just knew that it was the way and it was, you know, it was just, everybody should be doing this. That I had to really, I learned a few very hard lessons about getting a little bit dogmatic mm -hmm. about like, especially with other teachers. And, um, that was, as far as students go, that transition was fairly easy. Um, educating parents took more time and effort, but it was worth it in the end. But the real, the hardest challenge for me was the way I talk about music learning theory and music moves with other teachers mm -hmm. and not scaring them off. I can totally understand that yeah. because you get so passionate about it. So <laughs> passionate. <laughs> you want to tell everybody and it, it comes from a, a, a place of complete excitement. Mm -hmm. uh, but it can then also be overwhelming. It can, it can, it can turn some people off. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, um, you said you educated the parents. Can you tell us a bit about how you educated the parents? Mm -hmm. um, we, we were so fortunate at the Boston um, course to get some documents about parent education. And it was a great idea that Jenny had where she gave just a little half sheet of paper to the parents at the end of every lesson for the first 10 weeks. And it was just, a, you know, like a little bullet point list about um, things that they could be doing at home to practice that were not, you know, overwhelming to the students. And it was just like a little bit of education a week instead of trying to throw it all at them at once. And then, you know, there were a couple of other documents that kind of explained why we delay notation because that's, that's a big concern for parents who, are, who think that they're going to see a bunch of music reading in the early years. And um, so I, that was really good, having printed material that is not overwhelming a little bit at a time every week, give them some education. And uh, that was the most helpful. Can you tell us um, what you told the parents or maybe what that document said about why we delay notation? Uh, well, I think as the, the beginning statements are, it kind of goes through the whole list of things you see like uh, clefs and meters and rhythms and bar lines. And uh, like it's just a laundry list of different things that you see in the very first few measures of anything. And the point that she made that, that I think that people should make, uh, teachers should make to parents is that that is way too much. Like we would never expect a four or five or six year old um, to be able to like open a book meant for a 10th grader mm -hmm. and know everything that's going on. We give it to them in small pieces and we, um, we put the auditory first and then we use the words and we, and, and so the equivalent to language is extremely helpful in educating parents because they understand language. They understand how their kids language develops and that you can't throw it all at them at once. Mm -hmm. So that's um, a big thing to focus on when you're talking to parents is the equivalence of language. Absolutely. Um, what changes have you seen in your students and your studio since starting Music Moves for Piano? Um, my students are so creative with some of the things that they play and some of the, the chanting and singing that they do. Um, I think the best way to answer this question is to give some examples. Absolutely. Um, the first example, I had a, this little girl, um, she came to me from a, tr uh, a traditional teacher and wasn't in piano lessons for very long, um, but she came to me and probably about four or five weeks in, she had already learned Chow, I think was the song. And she seemed to really connect with it. And she, we were singing it in the lesson and we were doing the movement. And then I, um, once we were kind of finished with our, with my whole spiel, I asked them, does anyone, and I sing it, does anyone want to chant or sing? <laughs> and so she started singing Chow, but she forgot it halfway through. So she improvised a whole new ending. And I was just like, Oh man, that's, that's it. You know, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and that was after four or five weeks. Wow. I have um, other students who are just like rolling through rote solos. They're just like, they're playing gobs of rote solos and remembering them and playing them musically and fluently. Mm -hmm. That's uh, probably my favorite thing about what has been happening is above all, 
everyone just plays so much more musically and with flow and they can hear whenever something doesn't sound good or doesn't sound quite right. Not all the time. It's not a per it's not perfect, but it is so much better. <laughs> and I don't talk about, um, Oh, we have to shape this melody like this. And it, you know, it has to have an arch, you know, I don't say those words. We just chant and sing. And I do those things in the chanting and singing and then um, it translates to their playing. And like with the student books, once you get into student level one and you play everything um, separated, connected, loud, soft, it's like they are ingraining these very like fundamental skills. And so when it comes to the application to repertoire, all I have to do is say, okay, this is connected, separated, you know, and then we chant it and then they play it and it's musical. And I don't have to get into all this, you know, it's like the birds are singing and the, you know, it's just, they just do it. <laughs> right. Absolutely. I find the same thing. Absolutely. With my students. Um, you mentioned singing and chanting and how your students sing and chant and, and all of our music moves for piano studios. We're constantly singing and chanting, but for teachers that aren't um, yet familiar with jumping into this method, how did your students respond to now singing more and moving? You said you moved more, you know, before too, but moving freely and with flow and, and these different ways that they might have not done before. How did they respond to that? The young ones were into it immediately. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, they, they loved it. They, um, they liked being able to come up with their own movements and they were kind of, I think, a little bit um, hypnotized by my singing and chanting. Mm -hmm. And so they were very attentive and it was very engaging and all of the movements, um, they just, they loved it. The, like, I, that's it, they just love it. <laughs> um, with the older ones, it was a little, I didn't know how that was gonna go, uh, but I tried it with everyone across the board. Mm -hmm. I've made some um, pretty big adjustments for the older ones. Uh, we don't call it flowing and, you know, we don't, we call it something different. We call it stretching, you know, like in my college class, we do a stretch and, and but really it's, uh, it starts as a stretch, but it ends up being flow movement and it's not for as long. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a much smaller portion of the class or the lesson with older ones uh, than it is with younger ones. Like I would probably spend uh, 15 minutes just in acculturation and flow and singing and chant with really young ones uh, total throughout the lesson, maybe more. Um, but with older ones, it's more like five to seven minutes. You know? <laughs> but even they, a lot of them like it, you know, a lot of the older ones who are more open and not um, embarrassed by things like that. A lot of them liked it. Do you find if you're more comfortable with it and you're doing it with them that they're more receptive to it? Yes. And I tell them, you don't, you know, you move at your comfort level. Like if this, if you don't want to go all the way with it, you don't have to. Um, I also tell them, I think it's important to tell them that they don't need to sing or chant with you. Cause a lot, like when you start doing something, students have this sort of automatic response that they're supposed to do it too. Mm -hmm. you no, know, you just, you know, you move in your way. You don't have to do exactly what I'm doing. And so, um, but I, I have really cool students. I got to say, I got to give it to them there. They were receptive to that. That's great. And you also mentioned um, that your students are learning a lot of rote solos. So I guess with this audiation based instruction, do you find that students are retaining more of what they're learning um, or learning more quickly? Or how do you think they're learning all these rote solos so quickly? I think they're, because they are learning the language of music through the do days and do dotties, the patterns, the tonic and dominant and subdominant. They, they're just learning the language. And so it's the same when you learn um, the English language or any other language. If you have a strong and fundamental grasp of the language, you can apply it anywhere. Um, musically speaking, you can apply it to rote solos or reading solos. And then, um, in written language, you apply it to the different levels of books you read. You know, you start with children's books, you continually graduate. And uh, I think it's just the, the acquisition of fundamental uh, necessary skill 
And that's why they're able to retain is because they have the skill. It's not imitation. It's mm-hmm. audiation. I keep going back to that a lot. I don't want you to, I don't want my students to be imitators. I want them to be audiators. Absolutely. Um, and then do you use music learning theory? Um, because you're also in the preschool, you're in college and you mentioned doing the movement with some of your college students too. So you use music learning theory across the board. Yes. Um, I actually use keyboard games B for the first month and a half uh, with my college class piano beginners. They learn pretty much all, of, I skip a few just for time's sake, uh, but they learn all pretty much all of keyboard B and then they have to do a mashup. They have to do a duet where they learn um, some of the more simple duet parts or like I get a lot of students who can already kind of read music. So they might read a little bit from the more um, challenging duet parts, but um, they, really like it and um we change it we do the change you know like they play uh, a keyboard game and then i'll say okay go in your bubble they they have headphones on go in your bubble and change it and every now and again i have my particular favorite keyboard games in book b and i will i will give them my interpretation of the change it and of course mine are very flashy and you know interesting because i'm trying to show off for them so that they'll you know be on my side um, but the, I mean, like some of the, the, the creativity that I hear from these college beginners is kind of amazing, but we do day and we do Dottie and we do me so in the college level, the same as, uh, four year olds just in a, you know, different kind of a format. Right. Right. That's excellent. And then you also teach early childhood classes. What, um, repertoire do you use for that? Um, I use the music play. I use a lot of songs from music play. Uh, I got the CD and uh, put it in my car for months. I go back to it every now and again. Um, I just in, acculturated myself to all those songs and I incorporated those and the keyboard game songs um, into all, all of my teaching across the board for the, uh, for the general and music. And I, um, I memorized the, the format um, the template for, um, you know, like starting with a minor song and then a triple meter chant. And, and I just like, I can just do that now. Cause I did it a billion times. And so now it, it's kind of like this ingrained format. And then whenever I can tell that it's time to put a new song in the mix, you know, because they're, they're able to sing the song or chant mm-hmm. the chant very easily. I'll trade it out. Um, for another duplimeter chant or another, but now I have that format in my mind and I have this uh, vocabulary of songs and chants and I'll just plug it in the way I'm feeling that day. Yeah, I think you made a really important point there is that you had to acculturate yourself. Oh yeah. One of the other hesitations I feel like teachers might have um, is that they say, oh, I'm going to be singing in Locrian and Lydian and Phrygian and, and, we're not all taught that. I know that I was taught sight singing that I just went note by notes and, you know, raise this or lower this, lower this as I was attempting to sight sing them. And, you know, it wasn't until I actually went to a Gimmel course and was surrounded by, let's say Dorian, actually Dorian was the first one that I kind of got, um, you know, and they had us improvising in it. It was just flooding my ears for two straight weeks that suddenly, and this was only one to an alley of the others, that the light bulb went off and I was like, oh, I got this. So, so teachers don't expect to just know how to sing all of these tonalities. <laughs> you have to acculturate yourself. We're working on our own musicianship too. Oh yeah. You have to practice. Like <laughs> that was one of the other things that I was so attracted to music learning theory because I, I felt really plateaued in my own teaching. I was like, is this it? You know, and I'm not, you know, I haven't been teaching that long. I've only been teaching for about uh, 12 years, something like that. (laughs) But um, I already was kind of just bored and I was looking for something that was going to engage me just as much as it was going to engage my students. And that was the thing. I was like, Oh, I have to practice this. I have to like sit down and learn these songs and, you know, be able to sing resting tones and first pitch and, and find tonic and dominant. And these are skills that I was not the greatest at, especially when you get into the modes. Right. 
So yeah, I, I had to practice. You'll have to practice if you do. <laughs> I had to practice. I had to practice. I'm still but, practicing. But the improvement that I've seen in my own musicianship is it, that's enough for me. Like, even if it didn't happen for my students, like, I'm awesome now because of it. And I'm getting more and more awesome by the day because I can sit down and improvise in Dorian and Mixolydian. I mean, at a very basic level, but I mean, it's just, it's, wonderful like I write songs now I never wrote songs before MLT you know (laughs) right that's amazing um so I want to ask you a few questions that are actually from um either the music moves for piano teachers Facebook page and I also emailed my mailing list for the music learning academy um keyboard games course that will be coming out soon um so I'm hoping that you could give us some answers um so here's a question from Aaron and right now he's not teaching in groups and um, he's wondering what kind of, I guess, tuition plan teachers use for groups, especially with music moves for piano classes. And you don't have to go into how much you charge or anything like that, but just per- perhaps it could be helpful to know um, like if you charge the same for groups or is it more or less for private lessons, just kind of how you structure it. Um, I do. I charge the same across the board. The only Uh, and I only have two students that do this. I I charge a little bit extra for anyone taking a one hour private lesson. Mm -hmm. But the way it works is if you take a private lesson, you are likely to be overlapped. Um, And so you'll have 30 minutes of private lesson and you have 15 minutes of overlap time with another older private lesson student. So that's how I handle older kids. And those are 45 minute lessons total and they pay the same that a keyboard games young beginner would pay. And in the classes, um, a th- the classes are one hour. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, no, they're 45 minutes um, while they're really young, like from age four to eight. And then between like eight and 12, 13, um, they are either in a paired lesson and the time is a little bit longer, or they're in an overlapping lesson. So, and a lot of it depends on where, what's, what is going to happen with the schedule, because it's, a lot of it comes down to scheduling, but as far as just the tuition, everybody pays the same thing. I, I have done it before where, um, you know, like preschool kids pay a little bit less, and these private students pay more and it was just a big old headache. It's so much easier to charge everybody the same thing and you know, you give them their money's worth and it shouldn't be a problem. And if they have questions, you answer their questions, but um, everybody gets a minimum of 45 minutes and then some classes go an hour. Okay. And there are some flexibilities, but um, everybody pays the same thing. Excellent. I think that is really helpful and that will be helpful for people to hear because yeah. that's, um, that's hard to kind of think about, well, what do I do for that? And, and it I, doesn't have to be a headache. It, I've done it and it's just not worth it. And you know, what you're giving these students is going to be different at different age levels. Um, so there, you know, a lesson for a 13 year old is going to look different than a lesson for a five year old. It's just the way it is. You know, it's this part of the sequence. And if you communicate that with the parents and you tell them, you know, it's, it's good for young kids to be in groups. It's, it's, um, they can't sit at the piano for 45 minutes straight, but what they can do is sit at the piano for 10 minutes and then go sit on the floor and draw while another kid comes to the piano and what's happening. They're still hearing, you know, they're still hearing me play the MP3s. They're still hearing me chant um, do day or do dotty patterns. They're still getting acculturated to that. Or, you know, I have stations. They can go um, listen or they can go put the headphones on at the keyboard and make up their own songs. And so as long as you're communicating with the parents, like the tuition is what the tuition is. And, you know, when they're five, lessons are going to look one way. And when they're 15, it's going to look a different way. But you're always going to be paying the same as everybody else. Great answer. Um, Aaron also had another question. He wants to know, how might a teacher who's just beginning music moves for piano find new groups of beginning students aside from his existing students? And um, I guess in other words, how does he market himself effectively with music learning theory and music moves for piano. So have you started um, marketing, I guess, yourself in a different way or or telling new students this new approach that you're taking? 
Um, I, I don't really get into a lot of that. Most of my, because my studio is fairly well established at this point, um, most of the students that I get are referral based. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then I'm also kind of a, a teacher in the community who refers to other younger teachers because I um, can't always fit new students in. Um, so I don't um, do a lot of marketing, but there's a really good idea that I probably will implement one day when I start my music play class. And that is to find one parent who can find you a class. And you mm -hmm. tell that one parent, I will give you whatever discount you're comfortable with. You know, and that's probably the one time I would say to offer a discount to a parent is if they go find you a class of four kids. And um, especially, you know, like if they all know each other and they can carpool and, every, you know, it's convenient for them, offer that parent the discount to set up your class. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, I'm going to try that uh, eventually. Um, I don't know if it works, but I think that it, it sounds like a good idea. But as far as marketing goes, I would say play to the research. Mm -hmm. you know, there's so much really valid um, research that goes back decades, you know, get, um, into Gordon's research and then, you know, pull out the bullet points that you think might appeal to your community about, um, audiation and music aptitude and the critical age, you know, from 18 months to, um, age nine. And like, this is the time to have your kids in music and to acculturate them to different tonalities and meters and sort of, you know, play up the idea that um, it's, it's to the child's benefit to do lessons this way to their music aptitude. Cause that's a, that's a really um, it's a provocative word that I think people will respond to. Oh, they're going to raise my kids music aptitude. You know, that's good. And it, you know, there's a lot, there's evidence that says that it will. So, you know, use the research if you want to market. Absolutely. And I like your idea about reaching out to, um, one parent, because I know if I wanted my child to take something, um, I have a whole group of parents that I would just be like, right. oh, yeah, do you guys have Friday afternoon free? All right, let's do this music class. Mm -hmm. um, and we have that, we have not um, um, reached out to parents at Brooklyn Music School, but we have gotten calls and said, oh, you know, I have a couple other families that really want to take this. If you guys have a teacher at this time, we would love to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so that that could work. Let us know. <laughs> and then we have a question, a couple questions from Stephanie. She's still getting comfortable with teaching rhythm and tonal patterns. So she wants to know how can she start teaching these to students alongside their current methods? Um, she wants to jump into music moves, but she is kind of, um, she doesn't want to wait for herself to be ready to jump in to at least put patterns into her classes. So um, how, how did you become comfortable teaching patterns to your students? I have to thank Andy Mullen for that one, um, who is a really great music learning theory teacher in Massachusetts. Um, he has this wonderful YouTube channel called The Improving Musician. And I, I, at the beginning, I was not comfortable delivering learning sequence activities and you know doing patterns. And, um, but his YouTube channel has a set of rhythm lessons and a set of tonal lessons. And so especially they're, they're not totally appropriate for younger kids, but what they will do is get you in a place where you can deliver the patterns because you're, you're doing it with your older students and you're hearing it over and over and over again. And then that finally one day I was just like, okay, I'm ready to try it. And so i I just imitated Andy, you know, it's like acculturation and an imitation and, then <laughs> and assimilation. I went through, I went through the acculturation, imitation, assimilation um, process with his rhythm and tonal patterns. And um, now I can, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm still improving. And which is what I love about his channel. He's like, we're, we're always improving, always, always improving. Um, so I used that with like um, sixth grade and up sometimes I had a couple of fifth graders that I used it with and um, the, they're, they're good with it. It's not appropriate for younger kids um, because you know, you don't, How do I say this? It's um, th the video idea is a little bit more engaging, I think, for older students. And then you need more of the body movement engagement for the younger kids because they're 
you know, that's just the way they operate. Okay. So, um, and you know, but like sitting still and going through these rhythm and tonal lessons is okay for the older ones. And that's really how I got the older kids into the patterns. And so um, the improving musician, his name is Andy Mullen on YouTube. It will get you as a teacher um, acculturated to delivering lessons and how to talk to the students and how to set it up and the importance of breathing before the patterns. And um, I really highly recommend that as like a, a starting place for teachers who don't feel comfortable delivering um, the learning sequence activities and the patterns. Absolutely. The pattern, three, the pattern CD too. If you, um, if you're apprehensive about uh, doing back and forth patterns with your students, just put the pattern CD on and you and the student be the student together. Um, one of my favorite quotes from Boston was teachers should teach what they need to learn. And so I find myself often learning right alongside some of my older students um, patterns and modes and so I like, don't be afraid. And I tell my students that it's like, I need to learn this too. So we're going to learn this. <laughs> we're going to learn it together. We're going to learn it together. And they, and they're fine with that. <laughs> yeah. And um, speaking of the pattern CD, Stephanie also wants to know how you get students um, and parents for young students to actually listen to the tracks and the pattern CDs at home. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that answers the question right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, some parents are really good about it. Um, there, but those are also the parents who are always at the lessons, like wanting to see everything you do and know everything you do and how, what, like, what can we do doing at home? Those are the really eager parents. And I love those parents. Um, but I'll also, if you just at the end of a lesson, um, if they're iPhone users, I think we're, there's some people in the MLT community trying to figure out the best way to do it on um, other phones, but a lot of people are iPhone users. So you say, get your phone out, go to music moves for piano.com right now. And mm -hmm. then you show them how to get the MP3s on podcast. It's like, okay, it's on your phone. There's no excuse. You need to, if you're not going to practice, you at least need to listen to the last six tracks of, you know, this is for keyboard games. So you need to listen to the songs to say, um, excuse me, the songs in different tonalities and the chants in different meters and the back and forth patterns. Um, the, unfortunately, the pattern CD is uh, not available on podcast, but everything else pretty much is. And so if they have it on their phone, that is really helpful. And you can't just say, oh, go put it on your phone. You know, you have to sit there and go, go to the website. Yes. Yeah. Put it on your phone. This is the CD you need, you know, and, and that I think has a, a really helped because at the beginning, that was one of the mistakes I made. It's like, they didn't get it. They didn't understand exactly the process of getting access to these MP3s. And, you know, I would turn to the back of the book and say, you know, here's the website, go listen to the audio files. You'll see it. But that's not enough. You really have to like walk them through it, do it with them. Um, the same way you would walk a student through a new piece of music. You yeah, kind of I treat them like students as well. I was floored and this, I, I don't want to admit this, but pretty recently when I asked my students, they were eight or nine years old, how do you listen to the tracks? Well, my mom has to turn on the computer and then, and I was like, oh, my goodness. So I had them all bring in their devices and then mm -hmm. really do. You're right. You have to make sure that when they're really young, that the parents know exactly how to do it, how to get it on your phone, what to press, how to match the tracks. Um, and then when they get a little bit older, knowing the student, knowing exactly how to do that, how to find what they should listen for. Um, it's worth taking the time in lessons and with the parents. So you're absolutely right. You have to walk them through it because it's different right. it's not and sitting down on the piano with a sheet of paper and decoding anything it's right something and you have to you have to ask each individual parent what is your listening mechanism like is it do you need a cd do you do it on the computer do you do it on your phone like you need to be able to share with them how to access those audio files whatever they're listening mechanism is so if it means you need to burn all the mp3s to a cd right. because you know we don't have the cds anymore yeah. then do that and if it means getting your iphone out and walking them through the steps for the podcast for the yeah for the podcast do that mm -hmm. yeah and i think us taking the time in lessons um 
to walk them through it also shows just how important it is if we're spending so much time to make sure that right. they have it and that they'll use it um, at home. And then Stephanie's last question. Oh. Can I say one more thing about that? Oh. I just thought of, I also do a lot of listening in the lesson. Mm -hmm. Like I will play the CDs and the MP3s. I still have the CDs because I have old books, but um, I will play from my computer or through a Bluetooth speaker. I will do that so that everybody understands this is what you do before you start playing the piece. You need to listen to it. Or we need to listen to all the songs and the chants at the end of the, um, the last six tracks because it's important. And so mm -hmm. if you're doing it in the lesson, it kind of reinforces the idea of its importance. Right. And I think we've kind of all made the mistake of just assuming that they know how to do this at home, but they don't know how to do it at home. And I've done it. I've done it. <laughs> yes, I did it too. Yeah. Um, just go listen to the audio tracks. Well, how do they do that? And um, what do they do? And what do they echo? What do they play on the piano? Um, so Stephanie's last questions, um, which you kind of answered because your studio has a trust in you. She wanted to know, how do you get parents um, parent buy-in, she says, for a method that looks so different from traditional piano teaching. Um, I think once again, you know, if you read, if you read about Gordon and what he says, and um, if you kind of immerse yourself in his research, um, you'll get really excited and you'll have these kind of fact-based answers that you can share. Um, try not to do it too excitedly because as we mentioned before, <laughs> it can turn people off, but um, you'll have um, some really concrete statements that you can give parents. Like, why are we doing this? Well, we're doing this because we want to create musicians who think music who speak music who are who are just filled with music and not just imitating a piece of music in you know that like that's very impressive and that's wonderful but are they are they able to take ownership of the of the music and i think i use that word a lot with parents like what i'm trying to teach them ownership and um uh, and confidence in their um their abilities so and selling to the parents um is difficult sometimes but for like for me i think a lot of times um you're a little bit more afraid of doing it than um talking to the parents i mean like i think that they're probably more open and receptive than we often give them credit for mm -hmm. that's what i found um, i was a little worried but there was really no reason to be worried so I would say um, for just do it. And then if you get questioned, be ready to answer those questions. Um, most of the confidence that the parents that I teach or the parents of the students that I teach, um, they're confident in me because I'm confident in the method. And so if you are confident in the method, that will translate to, into confidence that they have in you. Absolutely. That's a great answer. Remember, I hope that remember answers the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's, that's an excellent answer. Be confident and know that you are the expert. Um, and, and, and read, research. read, yeah. like read a lot, read everything you can get your hands on that Gordon wrote mm -hmm. and know what the, what this is really all about. Right. And know that it'll probably take time to get through. Uh, oh yeah. Some of this <laughs> <laughs> but one of, I don't know if you've read this, but one of the great, um, books to start with is The Ways Children Learn Music by Eric Bluestein that goes over music learning theory. It might be a better um, introduction to it, a little easier read, and then yeah. the learning sequences. Uh, yeah, I would maybe save learning sequences for after you've read a couple of other things. They also, um, the uh, music learning theory for newborn and very young children is a, it's a shorter book. It's, it's a little heady, like learning sequences, but it's a I read that in grad school and I could pretty much um, comprehend all of it. So I would recommend that one too. And there's um, another one, the um, taking an honest and reasonable look at tonal and rhythm solfege, something like mm -hmm. that. And there's a lot of really good um, research based and good logical explanations about why we use the um, Gordon system for the due days and the due dotties, why we use solfege. And so you can, you can read these things and then whenever parents are asking questions, you can cite some of these uh, resources. Yeah, that's great advice. And they can find um, 
Gordon's books on GIAMusic.com. I'll have to put these links somewhere. Um, also, the Keyboard Games has a great introduction as well. I like to read through the, the Keyboard Games book, the Teacher's Edition. Um, Elizabeth would like to know, she said she'd love to hear um, if and how you wove it in for established late beginners and intermediates, or um, if you just transitioned your new beginners. Um, I wove it in for the uh, intermediate and um, middle school and high school kids with um, the Improving Musician site. Mm -hmm. And anytime they would be reading something for the first time, I would have them uh, analyze tonal and rhythm patterns using solfege, using the Gordon solfege and the traditional tonal solfege. And um, the other thing that I did was I put um, like sixth grade to high school. Marilyn might have some disagreements about this, but you know, I had to do what I had to do. It can be messy sometimes trying to transition kids that have been taking piano for a long time. Um, but I put them all in the Keality book. And mm -hmm. um, what we did with that book is we would do the melodic cadences and we would go through the checklist, but then I would have them improvise. So I'll put on the pattern CD. If we're working with uh, macro beats and micro beats, I'll say, do you want to improvise in duple or triple today? And um, they'll give me a meter and then we'll listen to the patterns, both the neutral syllable and the rhythm syllable. And then I'll say, okay, you heard lots of different combinations of duple meter, macro, micro beat rhythm patterns. Now you tell me one. And usually they can do that pretty easy because they've heard it and it's fresh. Um, and if they can't, then you know, help them along. Um, but then they take whatever melodic cadence or arpeggio or whatever it is they just played in the Keality book and they apply their rhythm pattern to that cadence. So if you're, um, if you're doing a tonic, dominant tonic and you're going, do me so, so ti, so fa re ti, do me do then you apply um, do, 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 day do. And so you would take the tonic and you can choose any note from the tonic arpeggio and create with that rhythm pattern. And then you do the same with the dominant and then back to the tonic. And then you say, okay, now put it in the other hand. And then you say, okay, now do it in one hand, but put roots in the other hand. And then you can say, okay, now pass it between your hands. And you just, there's a thousand different things you can do with that. And I'm still even kind of like thinking of new things off the cuff every once in a while. But um, the Improving Musician and the Keyality and Tonality book with the added uh, pattern CD improv, like incorporating the rhythm into what you see in the Tonality and Keyality book. And that's how I did it with uh, middle school and high school kids who had been in lessons for a while. Okay, so they're still reading. Um, you're kind of continuing on with their solos, maybe adding in more improvisation. Um, yes. are, you, are you adding in rope solos for them as well to learn by ear? Yes. Um, there's this really great composer that I like a lot who I think is getting into MLT. And I, um, I hope that he is and joins our community, but his name is Juan Cabeza and he's got these great rope solos and they're very attractive to older students. So I use those and we, um, we listen to them and we move to them. That's one of the ways that I get them to move is, you know, I'll help them find the macro beats and the micro beats. And I'll say, is it, does it sound like do days or do dotties? So are we in duple or are we in triple? Do you hear any divisions? You know, and then, um, then I'll teach it to them by rote. And so, yes. And they always play those so much more musically than they yeah. do by the reading. So, <laughs> and they like them. They're like, this is so fun. <laughs> you know? Do they also have a Music Moves um, book? Do you have a book one for them? Um, I, I, use, I use book one in the lesson and I will continue to do that. Um, there is, I, I didn't want to insult anyone's intelligence, you know, like these kids that have been with me from kindergarten to sixth grade and putting them in book one, you know, I didn't want them to take that the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do is I've been working through student book one with, um, a lot of my students just in the lesson, we'll do one piece. Uh, and we, like we started with popcorn and a lot of them were kind of like, what are we doing? I was like, just trust me, you know, <laughs> but it's like such a small part of the lesson in the grand scheme that they're like, okay, this is fine. And then when you get to a place where they're kind of starting to have a little more trouble because the solos are getting harder, um, 
or the the pieces in student book one get they start they do start to get a little bit more complicated mm -hmm. even though they seem really simple at first and then they sort of say oh i have a deficiency and they then they go oh, okay I, now i see why i'm doing this that's great that's a good realization for them to have and to oh, yeah. then um be open to you working with them and this right different way. So I think it's important for people that are watching or listening to this to realize that you don't have to jump into it with every single student all at the same time and do a complete and utter makeover, but to put these different aspects of music moves for piano into your late beginners, your intermediates, or your advanced players. And like you just said, they might then realize, oh, maybe we should work on this a little bit more. They might love the improvisation, you know, creativity projects from book one. So kind of feeling it out and seeing what works. And um, I think that's, that's excellent advice. Um, Rachel asked, and this is a good question, is there anything that you would have done differently with your transition? Looking back on it now. I don't know, you know. <laughs> or maybe just not dwell on it. It is. Um, <laughs> would I have done anything differently? Mm, I, I, I kind of like the way I approached it. Um, I mean, I think that's why I did it that way is because I didn't, you know, I didn't want to, like I said, I didn't want to insult any of my students by taking them so far back. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, you, you do want to take that and be into consideration and be sensitive to the fact that, you know, you, if you've got a student who's been taking lessons for six or seven years and you put them, stick them in something called book one, you know, they might not love that. Um, but I think if you're sensitive to that and you do it in a way where they, they say, okay, this is new. Um, this is kind of fun, you know, cause a lot of this stuff is really fun and you make it fun and mm -hmm. you don't take up too much lesson time with it. You know, you just do it in little bits and pieces, I think is okay. I, I probably could have done it a little bit more piecemeal, but I, I mean, I really jumped in when I did it and maybe I could have taken it a little bit slower, but I don't think that it's been to anyone's detriment the no. way that, um, I approached it. So, um, if I, I think the main thing I would have done differently is the way I, you know, come at people with music learning theory. That's really my big thing is that I needed to kind of calm down in my, um, the way I would talk about it with other teachers, especially. Yeah. And that's important to know and important to realize. And I feel like I kind of went through the same thing, especially when I was first introduced to it and, and saw what the students were doing and, um, um, it, it does get very exciting. Um, let's see, I'm just looking at our questions and you have answered a lot of these, which is wonderful. Uh, we have our group lessons, keeping parents involved. We talked about um, motivational materials that you use with middle school age. Middle school can be tough sometimes. Do you feel like you have to use any extra motivational materials or do you think that's you know, these rote solos um, and improvisation and creativity. Do you feel that's motivational? Um, a lot of my middle school students play uh, pop music. Mm. And, and we do apply um, some of the uh, music learning theory aspects to pop music. You know, um, like we'll talk about the meter and uh, tonality. You can do a lot with modes with pop music. So when you've got them like getting into Dorian, Mixolydian, I think that was uh, really motivational for middle school kids is, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you can say um, the Guns N' Roses song, Sweet Child of Mine is in Mixolydian. Isn't that cool that we did all those Mixolydian patterns a couple of weeks ago, you know? <laughs> <laughs> or uh and um then they they kind of see like bruno mars has like moments of dorian tonality and, and if you are able to um find songs where that happens and there's so many out there I mean, you can do a google search like pop songs and rock songs and dorian pop songs and rock songs and mixolydian and they say you know do you know any of these songs you know, and then you can apply Dorian and Mixolydian to the music that they're very motivated by. So um, most, a good chunk of motivation for middle school and high school kids in my studio, at least is uh, pop music. And, and we, we like um, the can't stop the feeling is another one. The, the whole thing is not in um, Mixolydian, but there are aspects of Mixolydian mode 
in that song. Mm -hmm. And it's so awesome to be able to have those conversations with your students because it gives them a deeper understanding of the music that they love and want to play. Great. Um, and I have one more question from me. Um, what advice would you give piano instructors who are considering this or are in the middle of um, a transition to music moves for piano? I would say um, there's, there's a couple of pieces of advice. Number one is one thing at a time. That's a, a very big philosophy of music learning theory that I, I have to tell myself all the time. And um, one thing at a time, what it means is exactly that. You do one thing at a time. You don't try and put um, too much instruction on the student. You don't try and put too much pressure on yourself to be great at everything. Um, the best way I think to start is just to put young beginners in the keyboard games book and, and really get comfortable with um, sequencing with following the lesson plan, um, getting yourself to a place where you feel comfortable singing and chanting and just, you know, start from the beginning. Um, and then as you feel more comfortable, maybe you start to incorporate the uh, rhythm and tonal patterns into everyday lessons with any age. Um, even if it's just like doing a couple of patterns at the beginning of the lesson. And then once they get to a place where they've heard those patterns enough and you apply it to the music that they're already playing and taking it really slow. And uh, I know, you know, jump right in is that's what I did. And that's what a lot of people do. But um, I think that there's like a little um, hidden subtitle with jump right in, like jump right in at the beginning. <laughs> you know? Don't try to just you know, <laughs> do everything all at once. Um, and then the other advice that I would give is to understand that like, yes, you're the teacher, but you are also a student of this. And it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort. There were nights when I would just stay up all night watching um, Andy's videos, listening to the pattern CD, listening to the music play CD, sitting at the piano, like trying to learn all the songs in the Gordon early childhood curriculum book. Um, and then just like practicing, like I have to practice this new thing that I'm doing. And so, uh, one thing at a time with your students and then one thing at a time with yourself and you're going to make a lot of mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes. Um, I, I did, mistakes. I did a lot of things out of sequence. I still do a lot of things out of sequence. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> and, and then, and then you're going to realize, okay, I made a mistake. I didn't give this student what they needed and that's why they can't do this. This is on me. And that's how you learn. You know, a mistake is, um, Robert said this at the uh, piano course. He said, a mistake is not bad. It's just information. And so um, the same way you approach mistakes with your students, it's okay, you know, we'll get through this. You approach yourself in that same way. I think that's a really big thing. And um, it can be really intimidating. And there's so much out there. There's so many resources out there, which is both fantastic, but also overwhelming. And so um, one thing at a time, little by little. And I haven't been doing this for that long. I mean, I was introduced to this um, 10 years ago or more, but as far as like being a music moves teacher, I haven't been doing it for very long, but I've already seen this growth that is really inspiring me to um, accept my deficiencies as a teacher and as a musician and do what I have to do to get to a place where I'm improved. You know, like, it's all about uh, one step at a time, one thing at a time. Don't know that it's a process and don't get discouraged when things don't go your way because things are not always going to go your way. Uh, and we, you know, we hate that, but it's just the way it is. And then other things, um, find a workshop, find a Gimmel course, um, go be around the people who are experts you know, talk to people who are expert, listen to, um, well, for your podcast eventually, whenever it's up and running and, um, 
get on the Facebook groups, ask questions, like go find things out, go be an advocate for your own education and um, you'll, you'll be fine. We're all in this together, (laughs) but get educated, like go, you know, do as much as you can, you know, financial, I know it can be a burden time wise. I know it can be a burden, but you know, you can read books, you can listen to podcasts, you can get on Andy's YouTube channel. And then there are other um, videos too of uh, example, um, like acculturation with the singing and the chanting. There are videos on YouTube where you see teachers engaged in uh, music play classes. Mm -hmm. And even though those are really, really young kids, you can apply that to keyboard games classes easily. Absolutely. And that's a great um, message to end on. I'm going to put a little plug in and, this is what I hope to do with Music Learning Academy is have a place where people can come and kind of hear a lot of information and take an online course on keyboard games and eventually there'll be a book one and book two, but just have a place where there's a lot of information on music learning theory and music moves for piano. And Hannah, this was excellent. And um, I thank you, thank you, thank you for joining me today and taking the time to discuss um, your transitions to music moves for piano. I'm going to have a feeling that there's going to be more questions um, from teachers when they watch this. Um, so hopefully, maybe we can have you back. Um, I would love it. <laughs> um, once you get some more questions. So thank you again, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks, Krista.